So today uh, we are uh, extremely pleased to welcome uh, Beatrice uh, Jurado. Uh, so Beatrice uh, performed uh, her PhD in 2002 uh, in JSI uh, with a co-supervising uh, grant by JSI on one hand and uh, by uh, Santiago de Compostelle uh, University on the other hand. And uh, then from 2000 when she finished her PhD to 2004, she was postdoc at uh, Ganil uh, and she uh, worked on uh, SPEG with uh, Wolfram uh, Mitig, uh, Hervé Savajol, and uh, Patricia uh, Roussel Chomaz. Uh, and in 2004, she uh, got hired at uh, CNRS as uh, Chargé de Recherche and uh, she's working since uh, in Bordeaux in the laboratory that which used to be called the CENPG and is now LP2I. Uh, and uh, she's an expert on uh, fission and on uh, indirect measures uh, of uh, neutron cross section. And uh, these topics are uh, very important for uh, nuclear application and for uh, nuclear astrophysics. And the uh, last thing that I wanted to, to notice is also uh, in 2020, uh, Beatrice, she was awarded, uh, she awarded the ERC advance grant uh, for the project uh, Nectar. Uh, and I think most of um, uh, the things that you will present will be, uh, are, are based on, on this project Nectar. Thank you again, Beatrice, and now the mic is yours. Thank you very much for uh, the presentation and for the invitation to present uh, this work. Yeah, so as uh, Jerome said, most of what I'm going to say is um, has been obtained within this uh, my grant, my ERC grant. So uh, the title of the talk is Nuclear Reactions at Heavy Ion Storage Rings. I will give a rather uh, large introduction into nuclear reactions, in particular the ones we are interested in, uh, neutron-induced reactions and the indirect method we propose to use to get them, the, the cross-sections. And I will also make a rather basic introduction to heavy ion storage rings because they are rather unique um, instruments and not very well known. Okay, so uh, let's start with uh, the neutron induced reactions. These are the reactions we are interested in and we are interested in the uh, energy re regime below few MeV. Few MeV. Uh, this is the neutron incident energy. So here is very uh, schematically how such a reaction occurs. You have a neutron beam impinging on a target nucleus A. And after the neutron capture, you form an excited nucleus A plus one that can decay in different ways. Here you see the decay channels that are uh, available. Uh, the nucleus can uh, release the excitation energies by emitting gamma rays, a, a cascade of gamma rays down to the ground state by emitting a neutron or by fission. And uh, the way we understand this type of reactions in these energies has been, is has been essentially a two-step process with uh, the first step being the formation of this nucleus A plus one, this excited nucleus A plus one, and a second step that is independent from the first one being the decay, the, the excitation. And this um, the coupling of, of the formation and decay is possible under the assumption that this nucleus A plus one here is a compound nucleus. So we assume that the reaction is slow enough to produce a compound nucleus, which is a nucleus in, 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 in a state of st statistics equal equilibrium, which means that the, all the uh, macrostates of this nucleus have equal probability to be populated. And in the, under this assumption, we can really um, separate formation and decay. The nucleus forgot, forgets in some way how it was formed, but of course it doesn't forget the quantities that are conserved in the reaction, like energy, angular momentum, and parity. Okay, now we are interested in a particular type of uh, neutron induced reactions are those involving um, radioactive target nuclei as shown here. And this, the cross sections for this type of reactions are very important in different domains like astrophysics, energy production and medicine. So I would like to insist a little bit more on the um, astrophysic interest of this uh, reaction cross sections. So this neutron induced reaction cross sections are very important for understanding how the heaviest elements uh, that we have in our universe are formed via the S and the R process. So in this chart of nuclei, 
You see here in this red arrow shows the path for the S process, which is a process that occurs in environments where the density of neutrons is, is relatively uh, not, not very high. And so starting from a seed nucleus, this nucleus can capture one or two neutrons and then beta decays. And in this way, slowly we climb up over the S process path until the end, which is around lead or bismuth. This process cannot explain the origin of heavy elements that we um, that we have on Earth, like uranium or thorium, to, to produce these elements, we need another process, which is the R process. In, in this environment, in this, uh, well, in this process occurs in an environment with a very high density of neutrons, huge density of neutrons, so that the seed nuclei can capture many neutrons in a row, like tens of neutrons. And, and then you produce nuclei that are very far from stability, in the, very close to the neutron drip line. And uh, then when the, the, when the decay, beta decay timescales are very low, then the, the, the nucleus uh, beta decays. And so the element number increases. And so in this way, we climb up over the R process path until we produce heavy neutron rich nuclei that are very unstable against fission. So uh, this, when these nuclei, heavy nuclei fission, then they populate nuclei in this region around mass 130, which can uh, in turn, in the turn, capture neutrons and beta decay and form again this heavy nuclei, which fission again and so on. So we talk about fission recycling. So fission plays a very important role in the R process because it sets the end of the R process path. And we have even this very particular process of fission recycling. Um, so we need these cross sections uh, of this very, um, uh, unstable nuclei, and, and these are very difficult to get with standard techniques, mainly because the, the, the targets needed are very radioactive and very difficult to produce and to handle. Uh, on the other hand, these cross sections are very difficult to, to, uh, to uh, calculate, mainly because we don't know how to describe the de excitation process the second part of uh, the reaction that I mentioned before, because this part depends on fundamental quantities like level densities, gamma ray strength functions, fission barriers, uh, which uh, we don't know how to predict very well if there are no data available. So without data, the calculations of these cross sections can be wrong by several orders of magnitude. Now, what we propose to overcome this problem is to um, use the surrogate reaction method which is uh, explained in this, um, in this slide. So here you see again how a neutron induced reaction occurs with the beam impinging on the target, the formation of nucleus A plus one and the different decay modes. The idea of the surrogate method is that when this reaction, you cannot study it directly, you can use a surrogate or an alternative reaction that involves a light charge projectile target impinging on a sorry, projectile, um, so a light uh, charge uh, projectile nucleus impinging on a target X, and you, you produce a two-body reaction, and you choose projectile and target in a way that you form the same nucleus A plus one as in the neutron-induced reaction of interest. And you will have this other um, uh, ejectile produced in the reaction, which, as you will see later, uh, plays a very important role in this method. So then in the surrogate reaction method, what we do is to measure the decay probabilities for these decay modes, for fission, for gamma emission, for neutron emission, as a function of the excitation energy of the excited nucleus A plus one. And these probabilities are precious observables to constrain model parameters. The model parameters I mentioned before, like level densities, fission barriers, and provide much more accurate predictions of the neutron induced cross sections uh, of interest. So here I show you the, the result of a benchmark experiment we did to check the validity of this method, because we have been studying the surrogate reaction method since already quite some years. So in this benchmark experiment, we used this surrogate reaction. We had a alpha beam impinging on a 240 plutonium target, and the reaction, the surrogate reaction was inelastic scattering. So in the exit channel, we had a scattered alpha particle, and the excited nucleus was 240 plutonium. So the corresponding neutron induced um, reaction to this surrogate reaction is neutron plus 239 plutonium, which leads to the formation of 240 plutonium, the same nucleus as in the surrogate reaction. 
Here you see the results, what we measure experimentally, the decay probabilities of 240 plutonium as a function of its excitation energy. So here, this uh, dotted line is the neutron separation energy of 240 plutonium. And the red data represent the gamma emission probability. In blue, we have the fission probability. So you can see at the lowest excitation energies, the nucleus can only decay by emitting a cascade of gamma rays. So the gamma emission probability is one. And as the excitation energy increases, fission sets in and it starts to compete with, new, with gamma emission. Therefore, gamma emission starts to decrease while fission increases. And then we reach the neutron separation energy where you see that the neutron emission, the fission, um, the fission probability starts to decrease again. And also the gamma emission probability decreases. And this is because above the neutron separation threshold, neutron emission competes also, is open for the nucleus to de excite and competes with gamma and, and fission. And so the two probabilities decrease. But below the neutron separation energy, the two only probabilities of the nucleus to de excite, the two only decay channels for the nucleus to de excite are gamma and, and, and fission. And therefore, the sum of the two probabilities has to be equal to one. And this is indeed what our data show. Here in black, you have. Uh, the, the sum of the two probabilities, these are these black, dot, black dots, and you can see that the, 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 they are uh, very well compatible with the value of one. So this was the first time that these two probabilities were measured simultaneously. And the fact that the sum, sum of the two probabilities below the neutron separation energy is one was very important for us to see this because it uh, validates the experimental method to obtain the probabilities. In addition, I would like to stress that uh, this type of reactions are the only way to study the fission threshold of nuclei like this, like two plutonium to, to plutonium 240, because plutonium 240 is a fissile nucleus whose barrier is lower than the neutron separation energy. So you cannot access to the fission threshold here of this nucleus with a neutron reaction, with a neutron induced reaction, because the neutron induced reaction would lead you to excitation energies above the neutron separation energy. So you cannot explore this fission fresco, which provides fundamental information like the fission barriers. Now, as I mentioned, in the surrogate reaction method, what we do is to use the decay probabilities to infer fundamental parameters that describe the de excitation process. So this is how we do it. So the decay probabilities can be described with this expression here, where you see we have two terms. We have this quantity F, which is the probability to form the compound nucleus in a given excitation energy with a given spin and parity. And, uh, and then the factor, this is multiplied by this term G, which is the probability that this, the nucleus in this, excite, in this excited state with this excitation energy and spin and parity decays, for example, by emitting gamma rays or by fission. So you can see this factorization of the formation multiplied by the decay probability uh, reflects this idea of the compound nucleus that uh, uh, formation is independent of decay. Of course, in a nuclear reaction, you do not, do not only populate one specific spin, but you po populate a distribution of spin and parity. So you have to sum this, um, these terms over the, the spin and parities that are populated. No, so what we did is to calculate these terms, you will see. So we calculated um, the, the, the formation probabilities this, uh, for this reaction in elastic scattering on, of alphas on plutonium-40. So this is nothing but calculating the spin and parity distributions that are populated in this reaction. This was done by Marc Dupuis from Monsieur Adam. And you can see here one example of spin parity distribution at an excitation energy near the neutron separation threshold of 240 plutonium. You can see in red are the uh, positive parities um, and in, in blue the negative parities. And you can see the spins, which are around five or six. Now, <clears throat> for the quantity G, what we use is to use the framework of the statistical model of the TALIS code. Um, and to calculate this G, one has to consider the number of states that are available for the nucleus A plus one after gamma emission, the number of states uh, that are available for the nucleus A plus one above the fission barrier. This is to evaluate the probability for fission. And to evaluate the probability for neutron emission, one has to evaluate the number of states 
that are uh, in the nucleus A1 that are available after, uh, sorry, in the nucleus A that are available after neutron emission. And this, these states are then weighted by the appropriate transmission coefficients. So what we did is that we combined the two quantities, the F and the Gs, leaving some key parameters free, like parameters of the fission barriers, level densities, and gamma ray strength functions. And what we did is to determine the values of these parameters by fitting the calculations to our data. So you can see here, again, the probabilities, experimental probabilities, and the full lines corresponds to the best fit of the calculations in, uh, in red for the gamma emission and in fission, uh, sorry, in blue for the fission probabilities. And uh, with this, um, so with this uh, type of comparison, with this fit, we could determine the parameters very accurately. In particular, the highest fission barrier, we could determine it with, uh, um, with an uncertainty of only 20 keV, which is much smaller than one can typically have, which is typically the uncertainty for the barriers is of about 200 keV. And we could obtain this very high precision for this barrier because we could measure the two probabilities simultaneously. So you should imagine that uh, when, uh, when normally one only measures the fission probability. So when you are trying to, uh, to tune the barrier height, you have some freedom in the, in the barrier height you can put. But imagine you increase the fission barrier. So if you increase the fission barrier, the fission probability will decrease, which means that the neutron and the gamma emission probabilities uh, will uh, increase. And so, but if you don't measure these probabilities, you don't know. So you can still play a lot with the barrier and you don't know you are doing something wrong. But when you measure the gamma emission probability as we do, you cannot play so much with the barrier height because if you increase your barrier height too much, you will not be able to, uh, to, to, um, to, uh, to be in agreement with the gamma emission probability. So this is the interest of measuring the decay probability simultaneously. Okay, and once we have uh, determined all our parameters, we can use the TALIS calculations, the TALIS uh, code, to uh, predict the neutron-induced fission and capture cross-sections of 239 plutonium. So here you can see the results. So here are the fission cross-sections as a function of the incident neutron energy. Our data are represented by the full line and the shaded area. Uh, corresponds to the uncertainty. And our, our results are compared with directly measured data by Tobeson and Hill, and with the evaluations, which are the colored lines that represent all the available neutron-induced data. You can see that the agreement is quite satisfactory. And here you have on the right, the neutron-induced relative capture cross-section as a function of the neutron energy. Our results are again represented by the full blue line with a shaded blue area and are compared to directly measured data by Hopkins and Diven and with the international evaluations. At some points, we are a little bit above the data. We are over predicting, but in, a, in general, the agreement is also quite good. So this experiment was done, as you have uh, seen, as I have said already, in direct kinematics. And it shows how uh, this uh, slide shows how, how very schematically which type of setup we use for this. So here you have the, the helium beam impinging on the 240 plutonium target. We use the silicon telescope, position sensitive silicon telescope, to detect the scattered alpha particles, measure their energy and their angle with respect to the beam. And with this information, we could say which is the nucleus that is excited and determine its excitation energy. And then to determine the gamma emission probabilities, we measured in coincidence with the scattered alpha particles, the gamma rays. And to measure the fission probabilities, we measure in coincidence with the scattered alpha particles, the fission fragments. So to obtain the, the decay probabilities, what we do is to uh, do the ratio between the coincidence, gamma rays, alpha particles, or fission fragments, alpha particles, divided by all by the total number of alpha particles. And this ratio, we have to correct it with the efficiency for detecting gamma rays or fission fragments. Now, this method of uh, measuring decay probabilities has many limitations. Uh, first of all, if you want to go really radioactive, 
um, you have to, you need uh, radioactive targets, which uh, as I said before, is very difficult to, to have, to produce and to handle. In addition, targets are normally, the, the, the material, the radioactive material is deposited on, on supports and often has um, also um, contaminants like oxygen, oxygen, which is very, very difficult to, to avoid. And this, the fact that we have contaminants and 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 and, and, and support, uh, induces a big uh, background because your beam also will interact with these contaminants, and this background is very difficult to or impossible to remove, and creates important systematic uncertainties. In addition, the gamma emission probability has, has large uncertainties in uh, statistical uncertainties because the deficiency for detecting gamma rays is generally very low. We have a few percent efficiency. And we would like to measure neutron emission probability. This would be very interesting, but it's very difficult to measure this quantity because you have to detect neutrons of very low energy and determine their efficiency very accurately. And this is uh, very, very difficult, so difficult that we don't uh, even try. So uh, one can solve many of these limitations by performing the experiments in, direct, in inverse kinematics. Um, first of all, one can access to very short lived nuclei, which are accessible uh, as radioactive ion beams. This is shown here. Here you see a proton inelastic scattering reaction in inverse kinematics. So you can have this radioactive nucleus now is not at rest anymore, but it's moving as a radioactive ion beam and is interacting with the light nucleus, which is, which is now at rest. And in addition, there is another very important advantage is that after the reaction, you will have a scattered proton and uh, your, your nucleus A gets excited, but now it moves with the kinetic energy that is very close to that of the, that of the beam. And here you see again the, the excitation channels by, for neutron emission, gamma emission and fission. Now these heavy uh, uh, residues produced after neutron emission or after gamma emission also move, move with a similar kinetic energy as that of the beam and can be detected. And this is very interesting, as you will see later. This is not possible in direct kinematics because these heavy nuclei are stopped in the target. But still, uh, we have one limitation uh, here. You have seen before that the decay probabilities change quite rapidly with excitation energy. And there can be also, there can even be structures like peaks of, or important changes of slopes. We will see this later. So we need uh, an excitation energy resolution uh, of about a few hundred keV. And this is quite difficult to get in inverse kinematics with the heavy ion beams that we want to use. Because they, to get a good resolution in excitation energy, you need to know very well the beam energy and the energy of the target residue and the angle between them at the moment of the reaction, at the vertex of the reaction. And this is quite difficult in inverse kinematics with heavy ion beams because these heavy ion beams are not very intense. So you need to use thick targets and then the beam interacts a lot with the target. So there is a significant energy load before the interaction, before the reaction takes place. And there is also a lot of uh, energy struggling and, and angular struggling. So it's very difficult to know these quantities accurately in inverse kinematics. In addition, as I said before, we don't want target contaminants and target windows. So here's where storage rings come. So here you can see the ESR storage ring of GSI FAIR. ESR stands for Experimental Storage Ring. As you can see, the ring is um, an ensemble of dipoles and quadrupoles um, that are arranged in the, and beam pipes, in beam pipes and that are arranged in a closed geometry. This is a quite big device. It has this distance here, this diameter here is about 34 meters. And so here you can inject uh, ion beams, radioactive or stable and fully stripped ion beams can be injected here. When you inject the ions in the, in the ring, they will turn in the ring with high frequency. For example, a 10 mU per nucleon, which is the energy we are interested in, they turn with a frequency of about one megahertz. Now having these heavy ion beams and, and uh, with highly charged ion beams, inside a ring turning is very is not easy at all because 
um, as they, they, these ions like to capture electrons a lot, yeah? And if they capture an electron from the residual gas, um, they will change the charge and they will move out the nominal trajectory and they will be lost. So you have to avoid as much as possible the interaction of your ion beam with the residual gas in the, in the ring, which means you have to uh, have an extremely good vacuum inside your ring. We are talking about ultra high vacuum conditions. This means that the vacuum in the ring is about 10 to the minus 11, 10 to the minus 12 millibar. This is four to five orders of magnitude less pressure than in normal nuclear physics experiment. And you can imagine how difficult it is to reach this in, in, the, in this ring, which is, as I said, rather big. But they manage, at GSI, they manage to have a very good vacuum inside, uh, inside the ring. So then you can have your ions turning, revolving inside the ring. Now, if you have your ions turning inside the ring, you can apply electron cooling. There is this device here, which is the electron cooler. And after some time of the, of the ions passing through the electron cooler, you will get a beam of outstanding quality, which means that the, the emittance of the beam is extremely low, low, which means the dispersion in momentum and, uh, and the, the angular dispersion of the beam is significantly reduced. And also the beam size is extremely low, is a few millimeters. So <clears throat> then you have this excellent outstanding quality uh, beam uh, turning in your ring. And what is amazing at, is that at GSI, they can even um, yeah, uh, uh, use a gas jet target inside the ring, operate a gas jet target in the ring. You can imagine how complicated this is, yeah? Because of course the gas will diffuse in your, in your ring and spoil your vacuum. Uh, so, um, but they manage this at GSI with a very sophisticated differential pumping system. They, they manage to, to dump away all this gas so that even rather close to the target, you have a very, very good vacuum. So <clears throat> with all these um, incredible possibilities, you have then a, 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 yeah, this, uh, this high quality ion beam turning in your ring uh, with high frequency and interacting with uh, your, your gas jet. Of course, after the interaction with the target, your beam loses some energy and gets a little bit uh, spoiled. The quality gets a little bit spoiled. But after the interaction with the target, your beam will go again through the electron cooler, which will correct for the energy loss and restore the quality of your, of your beam. So every time that the beam interacts with the target, it does it, it, does it with the same beam quality. So here you can uh, neglect all the, all the energy loss and struggling effects I mentioned before. Okay, the, the density of the target is not very high. We have about 10 to the 13 atoms per centimeter square. This is not enough to perform nuclear physics, uh, nuclear reaction, nuclear reaction experiments. The target is too thin for this. But remember, our ions are turning with a frequency of one, one megahertz. So another very beautiful aspect of the ring is that the effective target thickness is not 10 to the 13, but it is 10 to the 13 multiplied by 1 million. So there you get an effective target density that allows to make nuclear reaction experiments. So it's in some way a very nice way to have a, th a thick and a thin target at the same time. So all in all, what you will have is this high quality, pure, fully stripped beam um, uh, interacting with pure, ultra thin windowless targets. And this is unique. Of course, the price you have to pay is, the, is dealing with the ultra high vacuum inside the ring, which makes very difficult any detector development in, in, in the ring. So we have performed uh, uh, our first proof of, pr proof of principle experiment at the ESR in uh, rather recent, recently. This was in, in uh, June uh, 22, so uh, this year, uh, only a few months ago. So we investigated this reaction. We had a, a lead beam and we did proton inelastic scattering. So here you see again the ESR storage ring. And uh, on the top, uh, we see the part of the ring uh, where we have uh, inserted our experimental setup. So here is the target, here is this dipole, and here is this region here after the dipole. So we had, a, as I said, a, a lead beam fully stripped at 30 MeV per nucleon, impinging on a hydrogen target, 
um, and uh, the scattered protons were detected here with a telescope, silicon telescope located very close to the to the to the target. Then, when the reaction took place, the 208 lead got excited. Then the, the residues produced after gamma and neutron emission, the lead residues, would be emitted in a very, a very forward focus. So they move together with the beam until re they reach this dipole of the, of the ring. And this is also a very beautiful feature of, of the ring is that you can use the dipole as a recoil a spectrometer. So the dipole will separate your lead residues from the unreacted beam. So the unreacted beam will follow this black trajectory while your residues will follow this blue and green trajectory. So, it, it, so the dipole even separates the residues produced after gamma emission, the 208 lead, from the residues produced after these are the 208 lead follow this blue trajectory, and the 207 lead, which are produced after neutron emission, they follow this green trajectory. So they are more bent because they have one neutron less. So the magnetic, uh, magnetic rigidity is smaller, so they are more bent by the, by the ring, by the dipole. So if you put a detector here after the dipole and you measure the position of the residues, by measuring the position of the residues in coincidence with your proton, you know if the excited nucleus decay by emitting gamma rays, then you will have an event in this side of the detector, or by emitting a neutron, then you will have an event in this other side of the detector. Um, here you have some pictures to illustrate the, the detection systems we used. So the telescope was um, made of a silicon uh, strip detector, rather thin of 500 micrometers, followed by a stack of thick E detectors. You can see here the picture. This is the stack of detectors. Here are the flex circuits for signal extraction. And all this was put into what we call a pocket because um, we don't want these detectors to be in contact with the ultra high vacuum. So here you see the pocket is a sort of chamber where all this is put in and that separates our detector from the ultra high vacuum. And the pocket is done in, in stainless steel and has a very particular thing, which is this window, very thin window of 25 micrometers of stainless steel that was welded here. So you need a very, very good, uh, um, mechanical workshop to produce such a pocket. In, in our case, we were very lucky to have the help of the uh, mechanical workshop of the Max Planck Institute for Nuclear Physics in, in Heidelberg to do this. So here you see the detection fit system for the heavy residues. Um, again, you see a pocket and the detector was placed inside a pocket. This pocket uh, was in turn produced by GSI, also very sophisticated uh, um, pocket with a, a very large window, thin window, also 25 micrometers of uh, stainless steel. And you see here the detector being inserted into the pocket. And here you see the readout uh, electronics. Okay, and here I present you oops, some results. So here you see very preliminary, oh, but uh, very nice. Here we have the energy loss of the protons as a function of the residual energy. This is detected in the telescope, and we see the expected uh, banana. We see um, here a very intense peak uh, that corresponds to elastic scattered protons. Um, so uh, here the 208 lead is left in the, in the ground state. And this state is very interesting for us because 208 lead, um, for 208 lead, the ground state is very well separated from the first excited state. So we can use the ground state to evaluate the excitation energy resolution that we can achieve. And here on the right side, we transform this proton energy. Well, this was done by our PhD student, Michele Swatsin. He transformed the uh, energy of the protons into excitation energy of 208 lead, and you get this peak at, at zero excitation energy as expected because it's the ground state with a width of about 600 keV. So this um, excitation energy is um, uh, dominated by the angular uncertainty of the scattered protons due to the target radius that we use in this experiment. The target radius was 2.5 millimeters. And this is, what, as I said, what we expected. This is uh, confirmed here. Here we have the excitation energy resolution as a function of the target radius. 
And we can see that for 2.5 millimeters, the simulation, so I didn't say that, this is a simulation performed by Mikede. And the simulation predicts an excitation energy of about 600 keV in agreement with what we observe experimentally. So the experimental, uh, the experiment now validates our simulations. And the simulations then tell us that if we reduce the target thickness to 0 0.5 or one millimeter, we will be able to have two, two, between two and 300 uh, keV excitation energy resolution, which is outstanding for such uh, heavy beams. Now let's look at the, at the beam-like residue detection. So here you see again, the energy loss of function of residual energy uh, in the telescope. So these are our protons. And for the protons that all the protons that we detected now, we look at the position of the heavy residues in the in the detector. And as you can see, so here is the horizontal position. We see and here vertical position. We can see as expected two bumps. And this bump here, um, uh, well, the, the beam is around zero in this scale. Yeah, so the beam would be coming here. So the, the bump that is closest to the beam uh, corresponds to the peak where we have the 208 lead produced after gamma emission. And uh, the peak here, or more to the right, more separated from the beam, is the peak corresponding to uh, 207 lead. The, these are the residues produced after neutron emission. So we have a very clean spectrum and, and, and a full separation of the two of the two uh, residues. So this is very nice. And you can see here uh, the efficiencies. This, this was determined by Michele. For gamma emission, we have efficiencies ranging from 70 to 96%. You can see that we lose a little bit on the edge of the, of the gamma peak. We lose a little bit because we cannot get closer to the beam because the, well, for the, the, the detector will get spoiled. But still, the, the efficiency is, is huge, it's quite, it's great compared to what we can have in direct kinematics. I mentioned that in direct kinematics, we have a few percent, four or five percent, so the, the gain is enormous. And it's even larger for neutron emission, which we cannot detect in, in, in direct kinematics, where the efficiency is 100 percent. Okay, and now here you see again the the proton uh, histogram, uh, energy loss as function of residual energy. And uh, when we are changing the proton energy, when the proton energy is decreasing, uh, we are actually increasing the excitation energy of the uh, excited 208 nucleus. So if we get consider beams of, of proton energy or beams of excitation energy, we can see how this uh, heavy residue position uh, histograms change with the excitation energy. So here you see the position uh, of the residues uh, for excitation energy below the neutron separation energy. Then we only see the gamma emission peak because the nucleus can only decay by emitting gamma rays. And as we uh, uh, have excitation energies above the neutron threshold of 208 lead, we start to see, which is this plot here, we start to see events here in the neutron emission peak. And we see that as we increase the excitation energy, we see there are more and more events in the neutron emission peak until at the highest excitation energies that we populate about nine MeV, we see that the neutron emission peak becomes the most intense peak. And here you have now, these are very preliminary results. Uh, the Michele made this, uh, this uh, histogram just a few days ago. And this is the neutron emission probability uh, obtained in this, uh, in this reaction. It is the first time that this probability has been measured. Um, and um, so you can see here the, the neutron separation energy, and we see above the neutron separation energy th that uh, the, the probability starts to increase there, and it increases uh, until um, we reach about, well, this is the maximum excitation energy, about 10 MeV that we produced here. And you can see here, uh, around nine uh, MeV excitation energy, uh, a very steep increase. There is a structure here. And in this slide, um, you can, uh, I try to, to explain what is the origin of, of this structure at nine MeV. So here you see the uh, spin parity, so the, the, the spin distributions 
for positive and negative parities produced in this in the reactions we the reaction we studied in elastic scattering of protons on, on lead. So you can see here the spins uh, associated to the positive parities, which are uh, well, ranging from four, six, more or less. And for the negative parities, the spin is a, a we see a, a clear peak around seven uh, for the for the spin. And this these are calculations done again by by Mark Dupree. So these calculations tell us that the spin parities that we are populating in this reaction are between six and seven. So in this uh, part here on the right, we have the level scheme of 208 uh, lead. Uh, so the, the levels as a function of the excitation energy, here's the neutron separation energy. And here we have the level scheme of 207 lead, which is the nucleus that uh, is produced after neutron emission of 208 lead. And here you see the first uh, excited states, the, the ground state and the first excited states, the three first excited states of 207 lead. So in our experiment, we populate excitation energies above the neutron separation energy. And uh, as soon as you overcome the neutron separation energy, the nucleus can then emit a neutron, and then you have to populate the, 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 the ground state of 207 lead. But in our reaction, we are populating the 208 lead with spins between six and seven. So it's not so easy for the nucleus to populate this one half uh, state. So the probability for emitting neutrons is, is, is not very high. It's quite strongly suppressed. And okay, if you increase the excitation energy, more states are available. The spin is a little bit higher, but still lower than the spins that we are populating in our reaction until we reach an excitation energy of nine MeV. Here we have a state 13 half, so it's 6.5, which is quite close to the 6, 7 H bar that we are populating in our reaction. So for the nucleus, it's quite easy to go to this state at 9 excitation and uh, 9 MeV excitation energy. So this is why we see this, this clear bump here. Okay, and now let me go fast through the perspectives. So what we would like to do in the in the near future is to measure not only the neutron and gamma emission probabilities, but also the fission probabilities simultaneously. So for this, we have to uh, um, complete our setup. So you recognize again the ESR and our, uh, the part of the ESR where we have our setup. So we will complement it with some fission detectors that will be placed at different positions. Um, and uh, then with this, we will, we will be able to study uh, fission for the first time in a storage ring. This uh, second proof of principle experiment will allow us to measure simultaneously fission, gamma, and neutron emission um, probabilities for the first time. I want to demonstrate the feasibility of doing this. The experiment uh, was accepted by the pack of GSI, and uh, we hope it will be conducted in 2024. And after this experiment, what we'd like to do is to build a dedicated reaction chamber to in increase the target residue and fission detection efficiencies. In the longer term, uh, what we would like to do is use other stable. Ah, yeah, I didn't mention. So this experiment, we want to do it with a lead, uh, sorry, with a uranium beam um, uh, and a deuterium target. Yeah, and then in the afterwards, we would like to use other stable and radioactive beams. Uh, so for example, we would like to, after this uh, proof of principle experiments, we would like to use uh, radioactive beams produced by fragmentation of uh, uranium by removing uh, only one or few nucleons and uh, explore this region here. Also the region around lead is quite interesting or the region ar around xenon. And then when uh, we want to profit from the uh, upgrades on, in intensity of the beams of GSI to explore the region um, uh, around uh, of neutron deficient uh, fission in nuclei around N equal 126. And this will be the first time that fission probabilities are measured in, in close to a, um, a shell closure. This is very interesting. Then, um, it might be possible also in the future to uh, to to uh, make experiments with the ion beams, radioactive ion beams of high solder, because there is a 
there is a uh, the, well there is the proposal to build a heavy ion storage train there if this is done and um, would be very nice we could also make experiments with the the reactive ion beams of high solder which are more neutron rich and complementary to the ones of gsi and so i come to the conclusions um so storage rings uh, offer the ideal conditions uh, to investigate surrogate reactions and more lar largely um, nuclear reactions. We have performed a first proof of principle experiment um, at the ESR in June 2022, where we could infer the excitation energy resolution that is around 600 keV as, 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 as uh, suspected. Uh, we find a full separation of heavy residues uh, with detection efficiencies that are incredibly high, ranging from 70 to 100 percent. And we could validate the methodology for uh, measuring simultaneously gamma and neutron emission probabilities. And the perspectives are in the very short term to use these decay probabilities to determine neutron induced fission cross uh, neutron induced cross sections of 207 lead for capture and for neutron emission. And uh, we want to add a fission detector also to measure also simultaneously fission probabilities with neutron and gamma emission probabilities. Hopefully for this uh, experiment, we will have a smaller target radius so we can have much better excitation energy resolution and then build a dedicated reaction chamber. And uh, then once we have this, we are ready to perform measurements with radioactive beams. I would like to acknowledge all our support from the ERC, the CNRS Prime uh, La Prime 80, this um, uh, to that supported the PhD thesis of uh, Michele and the um, uh, uh, GSI and 2P3 agreement that helps a lot also with the, um, our stays at GSI. And then here I would really like to thank the Nectar Core team. So these are the people that have been most uh, invested in, in the project and without which uh, nothing would have been possible. Our two PhD students, Michele uh, Swatzin, Camille Bertelot, our postdoc, Jakobus uh, Schwarz, our engineer, uh, Jerome Piverna, and then our German colleagues, uh, Manfred Grieser from the Max Planck Institute uh, of Nuclear Physics in Heidelberg and Jan Glorius from GSI. And let me just to finish advertise that we have a postdoc position open in 2023. It's a two year position with the possibility of one year extension. So if someone listening is interested or if you know someone that could be interested in this position, please uh, contact us. And now I'm really done. So 